Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Mike Van Winkle. I uh, work at Pantheon Systems in San Francisco. Before that, I spent two years at WP Engine. I'm a WordPress expert, PHP apologist. And uh, I love Redwood Credit Union. <laughs> and uh, uh, I can't think of anything else. I'm originally from the South, moved to Chicago for 11 years, been in uh, Sonoma County for about four years now. <clears throat> My name is Chris. I work for a company in Petaluma called Cyan. We make uh, provider grade networks. So um, we sell networking equipment to the companies that AT&T and Verizon lease network space from in long haul fiber optic applications. I make uh, network visualizations for the browser. So I use web technology, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> they're basically web pages. They just show providers how their networks are working and or not. <laughs> Usually they don't go to it unless it's not working. I applied at Redwood Credit Union uh, a couple years ago. Split the seam of my suit pants on the way out of my car on the way in. Managed to hide that through the entire interview, I think. <laughs> but I never got the call. So I'm guessing all things happen for a reason. I'm very happy where I am. My background is in um, web software, media production, and music production as well. So I have an aesthetic creative background as well. And um, I have a little slide deck for us here today that I'll, I'll show off in a little bit. Um, my name is uh, Terry Biak. Uh, I'm the lead developer at The Engine is Red. We're right down the street. Um, uh, we're a full service creative agency and uh, I handle the websites that we need to build. Um, just like he loves Redwood Credit Union, I love Pantheon. <laughs> so I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I want to get started. Okay, so I will uh, start us off here. So the uh, the discussion today is, or tonight is on Git. Uh, how many people here use Git in their everyday work? Okay, so several. Um, how many people here have heard of Git and would like to be using it, but don't currently use it? Okay, so the majority of you. Okay. How many people here have never heard of Git and have no idea what it does? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cole, come on. <laughs> You're throwing off my otherwise scientifically valid <laughs> statistical sample. Um, Okay, so what Git does is it manages your source code. I'm going to use simple metaphors here. There's, um, on technical grounds, you could attack the accuracy of these metaphors, but for this discussion, they'll work. <coughs> it's like a managed, like, locked file cabinet for your, for your code, for the files that you write that create what people see when they go to your, your client's website, right? So it, it seems like if you take a second and you think about why you change files and why you might want to keep around a copy of the file from before you changed it, right? Then you start thinking about how you would do that with just the tools you have. Let's say you, you use Windows and you need to change 10 of the files in your customer's website. You want to keep a copy of the old website around so that if they don't like it, you can maybe just roll out the whole old website over again. or so that if it causes an unexpected problem, you don't have to go hunting for one line that broke it. You could just roll the whole thing out. So what might you do? You might make a zip file of the whole website every time you make a change, and maybe name that zip file with a time and date. And then you might save that off. And then the next time you might do that again. And what you would end up with is an accurate picture of all of your history, but it would become a mess and it would fill up your hard drive pretty quick, right? Even with all the zip files. So then you think about how else might you do this? Well, there's there's sort of file databases applications you could get into using, or there's, but all of them sort of have this problem of keeping around multiple images of these files. What Git does for you is it allows you to work in a very lightweight, sort of thin way to maintain your change history without having to have that big mess. All those files, copies, you know, in the old days, I go back, right? So we would burn a CD of it, save that in a file. You know, I mean, you can think of all the ways you've preserved history. So the way Git does this is by managing something called file deltas. And delta is just a fancy word for difference. So when a file changes, the sum of the changes to that file can be described by saying, OK, the file at this path, at this line number, now has this content. And that's all you need to save. right? And then if you wanted to undo that, you could just go back to how that line used to be. So that's what Git does. It maintains this quiet little hidden directory inside your work working folder of all your files where it keeps that little smart index of all those changes. So it's not keeping whole copies of your files. It doesn't balloon in size. 
And so it seems like it's this little tool. It's this little command line tool. Oh, you just install git, call a couple git commands. You know, it doesn't have the impression of, of a sort of workflow behemoth the way like Microsoft Office does when you buy it and install it. It seems like a big product you're buying. Git is every bit that big in what it can do and how powerful it is in its sort of stature in your workflow. It's a massive Goliath tool that really can be respected and, and expected of. You know, you can really get, it can save you from pretty much anything other than you know, pouring coffee in your laptop. <laughs> Git can, and even can then. <laughs> it can really do a lot. So, so it's a it's a, <coughs> it's a it's a very powerful tool. It has very simple applications. It can be used by a single developer for very simple, just version control, um, being able to roll back if you break something, things like that. It can also be used across the enterprise with something like GitHub. Does anyone here use GitHub for their work? Okay, so, so that other developers can change the same files you're working on and it kind of magically figures out how to merge them together so that you didn't just overwrite your friend's changes mm -hmm. when you save it, which if you go back far enough in time, in order to do that, I would have to check out a file from the server. And now if someone else wants to go work on that file on Saturday, they got to find me while I'm off snowboarding to check that file back in so they can now work on it. Git frees you from all of that. It's distributed, decentralized source control. So it does this, like I said, by managing these file deltas, and this is where it's magic, it's real smarts are. You know, Photoshop, the, the proprietary value add is in those algorithms that do those amazing looking things that it was really hard to solve. A lot of programmers spent a lot of time figuring out how to do that well. In Git, there's a value add like that, and it's the way they manage these file deltas and the way they can sort of magically pull any old version of your code out of the past and merge it into the, to the present any number of ways. Terry, you had had a, a point about the, what Git cares about and how it manages oh. content, which I think is right yeah. in line with this. So, um, I was hoping to come in a little bit later. Um, <laughs> uh, there was two things when I, when I learned about Git, because um, <laughs> Git does sort of bring in these, these concepts that are, uh, can seem pretty, pretty abstract, like checkout, like that's, that's a, that's a that's a word that doesn't necessarily mean you know what you think it means. So there there's a bit of a there's a bit of a curve there. But what really kind of leveled me up in in my understanding and appreciation of it is um, the first um, aphorism or whatever is that Git cares about content, not files, uh, which means uh, which means several things. It has some sort of under the hood. Um, uh, you know technicalities to it, but um, what that means is, where was I going with this? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think what you were highlighting was the the way that um, the way that it's you know like like we're talking about file deltas and the way it's looking at the lines that you've changed and maintaining a history of that and right. not images of files or copies of files or yeah. Or so so under so under the hood. Um, I, mean, I haven't fully investigated this, but what what my understanding is that you know you have two different files um, with similar content, you know, for for one reason or another. Under the hood, what what Git is doing is keeping one co you know one version of that and and sort of you know referring to it twice. So that's how how it stays really 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 small. Um, the other thing you'll start to do uh, once you start um, working with Git is um, you'll do You'll be you'll be committing committing things. Did we get to commits? We're gonna we're gonna go. Should, should, should I come back to that? Um, but uh, what what you're gonna see is you're gonna run this command git add or or even or even git commit on a file, right? Git commit index.html or something like that. Um, and so it's it's again checked into this uh, into this file cabinet, right? And then you're gonna make more. Uh, you know more um, changes to index.html, and you're gonna you're gonna be running git add again, and and that's uh, when, once you're when you're starting out, you're gonna be like I, what's, what are you talking about? I'm I already added this. I already put this in in the uh, in the file cabinet. Why am I doing it again? Because it's caring about the content of that file, not the the path. So there's new like changed content, and that's what you're adding, not the file. Right. Right. Get her done. That's my little uh, little uh, pun on my uh, screensaver there. Nice. I did that for you. For you guys. Appreciate. Um, it. <laughs>
Did you have anything you wanted to add at this point? No, level? no, I'm good. Okay. I'm, I'll jump in and monopolize later. Okay, cool. <laughs> So for me, Git was hard to embrace uh, when it came around. It was new. Uh, my development goes back to Windows desktops and using something called Visual Source Safe. And that made source control very simple. The files were on the server. You could get them if they weren't already checked out by someone else. You could make changes. When you saved your changes, you saved them back to the server. Whatever was on the server is what would get rolled up and shipped out on the floppies or on the CD-ROMs. Yes, I even once deployed software on floppies. Nice. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons why Git is hard is because it sort of takes, that's a very literal workflow. You can imagine your computer, you can imagine a file on your computer, you can imagine changing it. You can imagine the server, and you can imagine the same file on the server. You can imagine putting your changed version back on the server. Git sort of introduces some new little murky in-between concepts that are extremely useful, but that don't make a lot of sense if you're used to sort of a literal file-based workflow. So <clears throat> it's abstract, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the other thing Git doesn't do is tell you how to work or what you should do next. Git sort of assumes that you've thought through a responsible development workflow and that you want to implement that on Git. So that was an area where Terry had agreed at first it was confusing because you're kind of wondering, OK, Git, what do I do now? And Git says, whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do, you tell me, you know, which is a little weird at first. An analogy I would use, just uh, maybe more common, would be like think of like how ticket software works with like Zendesk or something like that. And you have a ticket, and everybody adds a comment, and there's this history of comments in the ticket. Uh, and if you start writing a ticket, and other people uh, have continued on the ticket, and you try to save your comment, it's going to say, "Oh, well, this ticket has been changed. You can't save this comment because you have to download it or whatever." So you go, okay, I get the new version, I paste my comment back in, I save it. It's real pain in the butt. Um, but but it makes sense as a workflow because you think oh I can't add my history until I'm at the top of the history. But what Git does, which makes it comp, the reason it's abstract and complex is because what it does is so dynamic that what it says is well I don't care who made the comment when I'm smart enough to figure <coughs> out who made it, right? So <coughs> you could you could be in the process of saving your comment and five people have saved comments below you and you get has kept track of all those deltas and says, okay, well, that's no problem. We'll just insert your comment in the in the history where it belongs in the history, and fine, you're done. You don't have to go back and, and, and go through that kind of lockstep um, um, process, and that creates all this diversity of workflows now that you can have because you have that flexibility. So. And ways to break things. And if ways you, to break yeah, things. Perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the last point here is uh, one of the reasons people find Git difficult is because it's it's very powerful in a lot of ways. I never hesitate to use the word vector whenever I can in oh conversations. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's powerful in many vectors, and by that I mean it's powerful in rollback. It'll, it'll save you from a disastrous threat of changes you've realized were horribly inconceived and you want to undo. It's powerful in merging and collaborating, so someone else can work for three months on the same file base and It'll just cram it all together for you and ask you about every conflict and let you sort it and help you sort it out. It, it's so it, for someone who's new to it, it can be difficult to see why do I want to use Git now and how can it help me today without having to go take a JC level course in Git for a semester. Just to, you know, there's th believe it or not, there are four or five use cases and workflows and commands that you could use even as a total noob to Git and get a lot of, of time saving you know workflow benefit out of. So <clears throat> this is sort of the, the nut of the, the presentation today and what I offered to really to try to, to clear up for people. Getting into Git for me, the hardest part was imagining where it all is and how it all is working and what it thinks it's doing. You know, like I said, I was used to a very literal back and forth file-based workflow when it came to source control. Um, I made the leap straight from not really using source control at all with a background, like I said, in Visual Source Safe and something called Subversion took years off of ever even really using source control. I just didn't really need it for my client's WordPress projects and things like that. And, and um, I, I didn't realize that I needed it <laughs> for yeah. my client's projects. Um, and then all of a sudden said, you know, I'm gonna give source control a try and get back. I've been hearing about this thing Git. This is maybe 2006, winding back. And I started using it and it just didn't make sense to me. And this really was why I was, because I wasn't really grokking the, the sort of visual picture of how it comes together. So. I want to sort of explain these areas. These guys, please, please feel free to like sort of chime in if, if I'm overlooking something. 
Um, but so what is Git? You know, when you install Git and you got a file and you git init, you know, your re repository in a, in a folder full of files, what is it doing? So the first thing Git does when you git init is it creates something called a repository. And you can think of that as your locked file cabinet of, of good work, of known good states, of, of saves, you know. Um, then the other thing it does is it sort of, you can think of the directory that you're working in and the files that you've edited as your working directory here. I'm just thinking like a pointer. Um, Do you have a laser? It's not that necessary. Okay. Um, so you can you can think, okay, th imagine sort of inside that folder of all the work you're doing, imagine a desk in a, in a little office. You know, not like your computer desktop, it's a different metaphor than that, but kind of like that. And now imagine that, that you've got this file cabinet and your client has called you and said, I need this change made. So you want to pull that file that makes up their that part of their website out of the file cabinet, put it on your desk, and you're going to change some stuff on it, right? So when you're on your desk surface like that, changing files, you're in what Git calls the working directory. And that is sort of the mess on the surface of your desk where you're making all your changes. And then there's this other area called the commit staging area. And I like to think of this as the top of my file cabinet. And it's where I'm putting everything that I know I'm done changing and that I like the changes for. So maybe I've, I'm gonna go through an example in a minute. Maybe I've changed the title on the website to match the customer's request and I've checked it in the browser, it all looks good. I'll go ahead and put that change in the commit staging area. And then when I do a commit, as you see here, you know, you got these lines between these areas. When I commit, it's going to go ahead and take that set of changes that I've put right there, and it's going <laughs> to merge them into the file cabinet and put them where they go, lock them away, right? So the main sort of benefit of having this commit staging area is I can put lots of changes into it and then commit them later all at once. And commits rule everything in Git. So when I make that commit, I've created an entry in that log of deltas. And that entry is revertible. I can say, undo that entry. And it'll only undo the changes that were in that commit. So you, you're creating these little folders full of changes that you're going to tell Git to stick back in the file cabinet. And Git magically knows how to run through the file cabinet and put all the changed files back where they go in the right place. In the same way, when you check something out from the repository, you're taking the version of the file that's in the repository, and you're going to clobber the one in your working directory with that and say, okay, I want the one from the repo. Boom, now it's on your desk, make some changes, add it, push it back. And then there's this area called the stash, which is like a, a little side place. I like to think of it as a little side table next to my little Git desk. And that's a place where you can put whole batches of changes that you're not sure about in the meantime. So you can sort of set them aside and you can decide if you want to commit them later. So <coughs> what does all this mean? So. Git sort of expects you to start thinking about your workflow in what I like to call a responsible way. And that's a little bit of a condescending term because I'm sure you're all very responsible professionals, care about your clients, you know. But as coders, we have to ask ourselves, is the way I'm working with this file the best way to work with it? Am I minimizing the risk that I'm going to break it in a desirable way? Am I minimizing my time, my overhead, and the, 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 the time I'm going to have to bill a customer for this work by the way I'm working with this file? And so it's asking you to think about your workflow. You know, would you just, how many people here today uh, manage a website by making a change and then using FTP to FTP into the live server and put the change on the live server? Okay. Okay, so it still happens, you know. Um, yes, did that for years, you know, in order to, to manage websites. And there's plenty of use cases and customer situations where that's a completely viable and responsible workflow. How many people here have ever accidentally broken something on their website <laughs> by FTPing into the website and mucking with those files? Okay. Now, <laughs> Melissa, of course, is a saint. Never. So, so of course, we've all done that. You know, we've all been there and done that. So, what, you know, this sort of tangents into something called automated deployment and automated workflow, which Git is a part of, but that's a bigger topic than we can really get into tonight. But one of the reasons why you would want to have an organized workflow with something like Git in it is to prevent yourself from ever being in those situations where you would be tempted by time and customer pressure to make those hasty moves, take those hasty FTP actions that led to a break, and now you're up all night fixing it. You know, So you're trying to think in a responsible way with your code. Um, unintended consequences. How many times have you made the change you wanted to make 
and you successfully <coughs> got it on the server and nothing was broken, but then your customer calls you a week later and now some part of the site you never even thought of is working different. And that was an unintended tentacle or consequence of, you know, the file that you changed. So that again gets into a tangent. Testing won't go there tonight. <laughs> um, change sets. You know, you want to think about how you can organize your work into groups of changes that logically go together because you may want to revert them later all at once. So that again is. That's where Git's not going to tell you what to do. <coughs> you got to be proactive and think, okay, I'm going to make these six changes that all, you know, affect the request my customer has asked for. And that way, if my customer unrequests that, I can undo that whole sort of change set. Um, and then lastly, versions, which is like sort of parallel, you know, versions of your project. I mean, how many times have you had a project where you wanted to reuse a bunch of static content in a hybrid mobile app? but you want all the CSS to be different. So now you need sort of a parallel branch or version of a project you're working on. Sorry, I'm laughing at you. Uh, <laughs> Don't mind me. So <clears throat> these are all things that you want to be thinking about when you're thinking about why you want to use a revision control system like it. So we're going to get into an example here that should just sort of break the ice. Um, so let's do a thought experiment. Your client calls and they want all the <coughs> on the website change to Papyrus from Ariel. She's she's laughing. Why, why are you laughing? Because I'm still trying to get people in my organization to stop using Comic Sans. Okay, yeah. there you go. <laughs> I was going to use Comic Sans for the example, but it was too yeah. obvious. I had to, I'm from Sebastopol. I was a web dev in Sebastopol for, for more than a decade, so I had to use Papyrus. It's, <laughs> it's the official font of all yoga startups in Sebastopol. <laughs> So you're pretty sure your client doesn't really want that, but you also know that he's going to force you to waste your time to convince him of that fact, right? So you're going to have to make this change to get their eyeballs on it, just so they can call you back and say, yeah, you were right, I don't want it. So you want to make this as painless as possible, this change, right? So, you know, just a quick reminder, we're working with this, this, these areas and how we're going to move files around here. And now let's throw a few caveats in, okay? So you have a life, you're a developer, you're, you're in the middle of something when your client calls. You're not starting from, from ground zero, from square one every time your client calls. You, you have other stuff open, you have other stuff going on, right? So you know your client calls and says, your, your client called a week ago and said <coughs> he wants a site to work more like Facebook, right? I, how many times have you been, <laughs> ever been asked to make it work more like Facebook? <laughs> So of course, donkey board, you're, you're banging your head on your keyboard there, and uh, oh good, was there a sign made? Nice. Yeah. It was cut wrong on the wrong end, so yes, this literally is a donkey board. Donkey board, okay. <laughs> so, 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 you know, for you, you, he wants to see this one change, the change to Papyrus, ASAP. He doesn't care right now about the state of his Facebook request. That's sort of a pending thing that he's expecting in two weeks, eh? And so, you know, you don't want to undo all the work you've been doing, turning it into Facebook. You just want to submit the site as is with Papyrus, right? So we're going to walk through this now. So I've got a file here called index.html. In a directory called more Facebook? In a directory called more Facebook, because that's the project. <laughs> more, 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 it should have been M-O-A-R. Yeah, yeah, more. That'd be more official. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here it is, you know, the site comes up, says hello world, says welcome to your site in the title bar. It's a very fancy website, as you can see. Um, technically, this is HTML5, as you can tell by the HTML tag there, so it's very high tech. Keep up the font. Even though it, it only maybe, can I? Yeah, I can. Um, <coughs> okay, so, so the client has called, <coughs> and I'm busy editing away, turning the site into Facebook. So here we go. Welcome to, uh, to Facebook. Okay, already working more like Facebook. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, please log in to Facebook. Okay, we're going to go ahead and save that change. We're working away. Hey, we're starting to look like Facebook. Very good. Okay, now we're going to go back a slide. Customer is just now suddenly calls and says, I want, I want to see everything in Papyrus. I don't care about Facebook. I want to see everything in Papyrus. So we're going to go here. And we look at our working directory, and it te we, we do a git status, and it tells us, well, you've got a file here that's been changed, index.html. 
And I say, okay, well, well I, I forget. I went to lunch and had a couple martinis. What were my changes? So I'm going to get diff. And it's going to show me. Well, right here, you removed the line. Remember, Git works on a line-by-line -line basis. Git's going to say, okay, well, I removed this line just like you told me to, or, you know, just like your editor told me to, and I've added this other line. Welcome to Facebook. I see that's happened. And down here, the hello world's gone. Okay. So I'm like, okay, this, this is my change set right now for my more Facebook ticket that I got from my, my client, right? So I don't want to commit this right now because, you know, eh, I'm just not sure I like it yet. So what I'm going to do to sort of push these changes out of my working directory but not commit them yet is I'm going to git stash them. So now that little set of changes, if we do a git diff now, there's no difference. Because all those changes have been moved over onto my little side table. And so if I do a git status, it's going to say nothing to commit. Your working directory is clean. It's like it kind of started over. But I have all that work sitting on the side in case I want to grab it and pull it back, right? So now we're going to go ahead and do the do the uh, the papyrus change. So just to show you, we'll refresh the site here. You can see it's been reverted. So now we're gonna we're gonna go back into Vim here, and we're gonna we'll uh, let's see we'll do uh, Arial uh, and we'll do papyrus, which I was really lucky to find out Chrome supports natively. Just like that, check it out. I'll prove it to you. Did I spell that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now, voila, the web is a little more yoga than it was two seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're good. This is all we need our client to see now, right? So now we're going to go ahead and, 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 and stage a commit. So I'm going to say git add. If we get status right now, it says change is not staged for commit. So what git is telling you is, hey, I see this file is different. But the next time you commit, the next time you go ahead and lock everything up again, I'm not including this change because you haven't told me to yet. So that little intermediary staging area is really, really useful because you can change a whole bunch of stuff, but when you commit, it's only going to commit the changes you've asked it to commit. And that's a very nice distinction to have. So we'll git add index.html. And now if we get status, it says changes to be committed. So the next time we commit, Papyrus is going live, right? So as, l as long as our automated deploy workflow is there, which I'm assuming it is, someone has all it. Going. So now we're going to commit, and we're going to commit with a message. Change to Papyrus, Papyrus, SMH. Okay. Is that going to work? No, because... No, because I forgot the word git. <laughs> <laughs> Computers do exactly what you tell them. You can't just type any old word. <clears throat> okay, so now we've committed, and if I go look here, it says nothing to commit. Working directory is clean because there's no uncommitted or sort of unspoken for change history lingering out there. So now, moving along, I want to get back to work on Facebook and the more Facebook ticket. So I'm going to go ahead and apply my stash. Oh, I have a merge conflict. I was hoping not to get into merging tonight. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So you probably saw the merge con conflict coming. Mean, you probably knew. But I'm not that bright. Well, should we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, yeah, let's talk about what he's doing here. So, what the merge conflict is going to do is it's going to give you the same file, but it's going to delimit. The part that's either uh, in this case it's in the quote upstream, which is uh, which is upstream of the stash, right? The stash uh, upstreams are nice are always a metaphor when version controls. So um, so upstream here is the the canonical the more canonical version, the more uh, authoritative version than your version, right? The stash version is the least. Uh, um, Actually, no. That's that's wrong here, isn't it? No, it's right because I. Yeah, committed. it is right. You stash you stash the aerial. Right. So um, so yeah. So uh, so the upstream is the more authoritative version. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it'll say head, and what head is is uh, is get saying that's the head is like the top commit, right? That's like the main commit, uh, and then it's delimiting with this equal signs the version of the file that is in the conflicting portion, and so you have to choose between what's above the equals and what's below the equals. And, and before you're done, you have to get rid of all this markup that yes, they gave absolutely. you to. 
So, so what we're gonna like that. what we're gonna do What's is or we'll commit it like that. Or we'll commit it like that, yeah. and then you've really broken it. <laughs> now, yeah, I'm showing you the way this works at a command line, real deal. So you kind of know what it's doing under the hood. In practice, a lot of us use. Um, you know, IDEs, integrated development environments, oftentimes those will have a Git plugin or good visual Git support. You often don't have to see this. You can resolve <laughs> conflicts with the help of a program like that that'll show you the two and just let you pick, keep this, yeah, keep that, right, you know. Right. So we're gonna do that here. I'm gonna say, okay, well, I know I don't want Hello World because I want the Facebook version of that line, which is right here. But I also know I don't want Arial. I want the Papyrus version because I wanna live with that change for now. So what I've just done is manually merged mm -hmm. these two different versions of this file and uh, now like we were talking about I got to commit my uh, I got to commit my merge changes so with my usual very verbose commit message merged <laughs> and then we we'll go back here and what we have is the Facebook version with papyrus so now we've got sort of the sum of all of our changes in one place so having walked through uh, that example go back sort of to the discussion here. Could you have worked on the Facebook uh, part uh, without committing, just working in your working directory? Yes, uh, and the reason why I did do the commit in the example is because oftentimes sort of the piece I left out was the git push. So after we commit, in order to push that change live, if we've got our automated deploy set up just right, mm -hmm. we would git push and that would push that change to a server that's being watched. And that would then deploy. That would either go straight to a viewable uh, staging server, like IE, the place I'm pushing to may have a web server running where I can view it for like testing purposes and then decide I want to push it to a live server. <coughs> or it might just be something that a automated deployment bot is watching and is going to go ahead and push to a server for me. But another question that comes out of that would be so, so you change it to Papyrus, but it takes your customer two days to decide how do you keep working on your Facebook <coughs> right. and that's where branches uh, help in because you can actually create a branch to say it's a little bit more than a stash it's to say I want to create a branch that's going to have multiple commits um, uh, on this one feature mm -hmm. uh, and then keep it separate from the master or the the main branch and then I'll bring it back when I'm ready I'll put the two together uh, and it works like a stash uh, but it's just a little bit more involved, and uh, and it's it's more for keeping a separate set of changes for a longer period of time. It's like a it's like a stash that persists. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. a stash is, is a very ephemeral thing. Uh, a branch. So there's there's problems with the example I just gave you guys, and it was sort of meant more to make you think about how you might use Git, why you might want to use Git, and to make you start thinking of questions. Um, so in a sense, it was sort of meant to confuse you a little bit because sometimes that's a really good way to dig in. Is to have work? a reason why you want to Google stuff um, and start looking around. So, so yeah, a, a better way to do that would have been to branch it. To, to branch it. Um, so now that the papyrus changes are live, you want to revert back. We just did all of that. Um, no, actually, okay. So we did when we applied the stash. We put that away. Um, we don't mind the papyrus change, so we're going to go ahead and bring in the stash to merge everything together into one thing. Um, okay, so then last thing here. Client calls hates the font change. So what might you do? How might you now unwind the fact that we've committed that font change? Well, the easy way would just be go in and change the file. It was only one word, right? But that'd be cheating. We want to do it with the tools. So this is actually perfect because I'm terrible at reverting. I've never been able to figure it out, so I just <laughs> honestly really avoid making changes I don't want, which causes a very long and slow, uh, painful process. So actually, I was going to ask Michael if we wanted to get rid of the papyrus change. Um, so what I would generally <coughs> do here, if this were me, I would create a new branch okay. to save this current working state. Right? Okay. So that's the other thing you can use a branch for. Say, I'm going to make some changes, but I might want to come back to this. So you can do get branch. Actually, you can just do get checkout dash b. Yeah. Uh, new branch or Facebook branch or whatever you want to call it. Right. Okay. Um, and then I would do the git revert. So to do the git revert, you've got to know what commit you want to revert. So you do git log, which you just did, and this shows you the different commits. Uh, and I believe the thing with git revert is if you do it with dash r, it'll recursively revert 
all of the commits, but I think if you just do git revert and the commit number, it'll just do the one commit. So try the, is that the commit? You can do git, to, to, so to, to preview whether or not you're reverting the right commit, you know, git show and then that commit number. This big old thing, uh -huh. which you can just double tap and copy and paste. Yeah. So that'll show you, okay, yes, that's the change. That's the exact change we want to right. undo. So now if you do git revert and then the commit number, Prior set to resolve the conflicts, Mark. So now you've got another, you've got another uh, conflict. So um, what you could do, so we're making this more complex. But you got to do, you got to do the merge conflict again. If you wanted to undo the revert, you could do a git reset, and we could try a different strategy. But um, um, so yeah, so now you've got all the commits up. Now you can just check out that file. And you get checkout that says go back to whatever the original version of it is. Okay. So let's pause on that for yeah, a minute. So a check out, here. check out is a word that uh, used to mean one thing in version control, means something different in Git. So in Git, when you check out a file, what you're saying is whatever's in the working directory, whatever hackneyed thing I've gone and done for the last two hours, yeah. blow it away and replace it with the version I know yeah. what it is that was the one that's in the repo that's been committed. So take me back to the last known yeah. state, right? Yeah. Okay. So is that's there, what we. Is there any way to take what you were just talking about blowing away and sort of make a second stash out of it, or somehow the preserve that right? off? Right. So the best way to handle that would either be with the stash, or better with a branch. And so let's let's do an example of branching because it's, I think it's hard. To well, we did. We created the branch. For okay. The, um, um, so, oh, you're right. Well, we got to fix this first, and then right. Merge. Oh, so you got to change to master. That was the problem. That was the confusion here. So, if you oh, okay. So if we so uh, we created the Facebook branch, but we're still on the Facebook branch, which you just did by getting Git branch. So no changes on master. So no changes on master. So we'll go back to Facebook. Well, no, you still want to revert, right? We still want to revert. Revert Facebook. No, we want to revert master back to without providers. Yes, you're right. right? So, so <coughs> get log and try doing try do the um, um, I mean I I know the pro tip way to do this but I don't want to go there I don't want to try to do it with straight up the pro t uh, so try doing git revert r and let's just see if it rolls everything back capital r or okay. small r. small r and we're gonna go back to that same one yeah go back to that same commit what does right. capital r do. No, capital R doesn't. Oh, you don't want to mess with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that deletes everything. Right, do get reset don't, don't do capital R. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we have to do get check out again. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a way to do this without a merge conflict, right? And sometimes you just can't avoid merge conflicts. So it's, it really will do you, it'll do you good to not be afraid of merge conflicts and, and fixing them. They are... Yeah. Being comfortable with them is really important. If yeah, you absolutely. Because it, it'll, it'll just happen. And the problem here is it's the same line has changed. Um, so I'll show you the pro tip way. The pro tip way that I would do, would I would say get show colon commit number. Like that? I'm sorry, no. Sorry. Get show show index.html space commit number. Oh, no, 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 no. Colon. Colon. Yeah. Get show <laughs> colon index. That HTML, right, and the commit number, right, and hit it. Get show colon space. Isn't it? Oh, you're right. You're right. It's. I'm sorry. Commit number. Sorry. Take out the index.html. It's show space commit number colon index.html. Point is, what you uh, could do yeah. is you tell it show me show me the version of this file as it was in this chain right. set. And so you hit enter, and you're just going to get the that's the HTML you want to revert. So now you do the same command, but then you would do a redirect, which was the the greater than sign. Right. So you do the redirect to just one, just one, redirect to index.html. All right. So now if you do git diff, it should show you that you've changed it back. To gotcha. Arial and back to welcome to your site. <laughs> Except that it didn't change back to Papyrus. Yeah, no, we went to the wrong, it's because we went to the wrong, wrong commit number. Yeah. All right, we're getting down in the weeds here. <laughs> okay. It is fun. So, right. yeah, so you right? do get revert and you'd solve the merge conflict. 
essentially. This is all a carefully crafted example to show you. <laughs> this is why you never demo live. This right. Is, yeah. Should have made a video. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, if we had picked the right commit here, this would literally have replaced the current file with the version that right. we have. Um, right. So you could go ahead and commit this just to prove the point and then merge back in the Facebook branch is what I was going to have to do. So, all right. So now it's clean. He's committed his reversion, reversion, and now you can merge back in the Facebook work in theory. Oh, but it already had all the changes because it just added. Because of the command we went to was the yeah, one the, that right. just happens so to be the yeah. one that takes okay. us to the state we want. Yeah. So anyway, here, here we now we showed how confusing Git can get with like where the history is. Yeah. And all that, but. Done a great job. Can we really confuse them with rebasing now? Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> the 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 GUIs will in some ways be a little bit easier here, but mm -hmm. um, uh, but anyway. All right. Fail. Demo fail. Well, it's okay. Guys. We got close. So you know the other areas we would want to talk about to have a full understanding of Git and sort of what it does as a tool. Branches, like we just headed off into, and we'll talk about this more. In the Q and A. Uh, what the log is, you saw the log, it just shows you your recent history of commits on the branch that you're on, which is usually master. Um, you know, reversion, how reversion works, or in our case doesn't work, or in our case when we, uh, you know, when you want to, and then merging, <coughs> you actually saw merging happen. So you saw the, the sort of ultimate question of something, when, when Git makes its value proposition, it says I'm going to let person A work on a file, person B work on a file, and I'm going to deal with it when the two files don't play nice together when I want to cram them together. Well, that dealing with it is what you saw in that merging process. Somebody somewhere has to decide if two changes have been made to the same line of the same file, some human has to decide which one is the authoritative change that I actually want, right? So that's when you're going to see a merge conflict, and that's when you'll resolve that either manually or with the help of a GUI tool. Yeah. Um, so if you change other lines of code rather than that same one, that's right. Would it would have been actually pretty easy. To it would have been very easy. Yeah. To right. right. But it was the fact that we're changing. Sure. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So my slide deck comes to an end there. Um, I'd like to encourage these gentlemen to add anything they'd like to and or so take questions. On reversion before, just to, to make the point here, that reversion is not an easy thing in any version control software. Uh, and there's actually an argument there's some people that argue in Git, especially you never, you should never really revert. Um, and you can Google different examples of how to undo a change without reverting. And the reason is is that if you've got history, if you think of history as like a racetrack, and you got two people working on the same code base and they're going at different paces, and you go here, and and the other guy is back here, but then you decide you want to revert something, and then you go back. But he's already pulled in the change that you made that now you want to revert. Now you've got a problem. And so, and so the argument is, is that it, just in terms of reversion, that it's always better to create the diff, which what you did, and then you can patch, you can it's, Google it, it'll show you how to do it. And you, you can patch using the diff, and so it'll become a commit on top of your commit <coughs> on doing it. So you never have that problem of going back in history and reverting a commit that somebody else has already sort of done, um, because that kind of creates that's like mind blowing to get. It's like what do we do like, now? Yeah. Now, now what we're do? in trouble, right? Yeah. yeah. Now everyone has to revert to the same commit that you reverted, and to. then replay their changes. And on then, top. Uh, yeah. yeah. There is though one uh, uh, productive way to change history. And it's called rebasing. Yes. Should we do this? I think we're going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted to understand rebasing myself, so I would be totally over that. Rebasing. Rebasing. I mean, I don't know what you're doing later, but. Rebasing is another uh, way to rewrite your history. Yeah, but so. That's a different one. I, ho I hope by now you've gotten the sense of your commit history as this sort of, this linear, you know, stack on, on top of each other of, of commits. Um, and so, yeah, history is very important. Like, what came from what? Um, so there's this, this concept of, of rebasing, which is uh, usually in the context of a branch, right? So, so you have, you have you know, one branch, and at some point it diverges. Um, because I'm working on, I'm testing on something, I'm creating, creating Facebook from scratch. 
Um, rebasing is basically saying I'm going to, and this is a, an abstraction, but we can talk about what it actually means is uh, pluck it off of the commit that it came from and stack it on top of your most your most recent commit. Um, why why would you do what's up? From a branch. So it's you're taking it from a branch and putting it on the main yes. on the main one. Yes. It's an alternative to merge. Yeah, it's it's another way of, of, of blending of blending to two branches. And so a nice way to think about it is you can uh, you can do it actually ends up letting you do some magic stuff, um, which is pretty fantastic. So you're working on a feature. Um, do you ever use SAS much? Yeah. So think about uh, a situation where you'd use an include, right? You'd, uh, you'd include a, a, a mix in um, in the context of, of some section of the site uh, of the site you're working on. Well, what you can be doing is uh, you're working on that feature branch. You go, you check out master, you make a change to that to that uh, to that mix in that you're working with. You go back to you go back to your feature branch and you and you rebase. You've changed nothing on on that branch, and suddenly that mixin works differently now. Or or maybe it was or maybe it's a class, you know, in, in some sort of you know object oriented, um, uh, you know, um, code base code base you're working on. Um, but it, it's a really it's a really fun way to to be playing with history in a in a productive way. Um, that, another, that, was, that was the one that really blew my mind. Another another really great usage of rebase and, and the why people use it is, um, except for those people who are perfect, um, mm -hmm. what I often do is I'll make a commit and be like, okay, this is the definitive change to this color, blah, 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 and I'll put it up there. <laughs> and then I'll be like, no, that sucks. Okay, this is the definitive <laughs> commit to this color. And next thing I know, oh. I've got five commits in a row that say this is the definitive <laughs> commit to this color. <laughs> right. And so anybody reading the change history says, uh, what's with this guy? Yeah, what's yeah. going? What's going on? So mm -hmm. what you can do with a rebase is actually you can say, um, you can say um, there's a little command called rebase i, and, and there are tutorials you can find online how to do it. Interactive, um, and you could say, okay, I want to take all five of these, and I want to just roll them into one. I, I want to take I want to take uh, one commit. Yep. I'll take That's the top dope. commit, the, the the last commit that I made that really was the definitive change. And I'm just going to take all the other changes, roll that in, and get rid of all the other change messages so it cleans up the log. So instead of seeing five commits for all that crap, the mistakes you made, now you've got one line. And then, because you've changed history, if you haven't pushed anything up, it's fine. If you have already pushed those bad changes up, now you have to do a, a push-f, which is a force. Um, the problem with that is with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, it's really great to do a force push when you're on your own branch and you're working on your own branch that has not been merged into master. But if you're working on master, you're playing with fire. Because if somebody else has checked out master and then you do a force, we got the same problem we had before, which was, oh, I just rebase all this stuff uh, and change the history, especially when you're actually squashing commits. Right. Um, I changed the history and now somebody else has a different history than I do. So you got you play with fire. Yes. But so his example would not his example would not require a force because you're not you're not removing any commits. Um, you're just changing the order, so to speak. So if you squash the main set of commits, yeah, effectively you're removing X number of commits. Effect, right? Yes. And then there was an orphan commit out there that somebody has a branch of. Um, then, well, then does get. Go, I don't know what that is when you try to. Their branch that. is going to be now defunct and not able to merge into the. So, so, you, yeah. so, so this is why you really, in order to, to use that strategy, and, and, and a lot of companies with a lot of developers will use um, not only a branching strategy, but a forking strategy. So, like at Pantheon, every developer, we all have our own forks of the repo. And a fork is something that's kind of more about GitHub, less about Git. Right, so what GitHub says is, oh, I can click a fork button, and I get my own version of the repo that I can then do stuff and then submit changes back to the main <coughs> repo. Um, but I can't really affect the main repo without making that like a formal request. Um, to merge, to in, merge to it in. Um, I, so can't, I can't merge it myself. I have to have somebody who owns the main repo to say, okay, that looks good, I'll, I'll merge it in. And so that way no one person is ever working yeah. on master. Master yeah. is 
machine maintained, it's got all these guards and yeah. protections around it, right. and what you're playing with when you break everything under the sun is your own fork, yeah. which that's can always be... In kit. Right, that's so... That's a chosen workflow, right? Right, right. right. and so chosen what you're saying there is I need this extra protection, I'm going to use something like GitHub to give me this environment where I can fork repositories for different users. The user then clones their fork, and when they push, they push to their fork, and they go up and say, pull request, I want my change to now be part of the master. So when you get into the collaborative use of Git, a tool like that just becomes indispensable. There's a, I mean, I th there, there's a bit of a lighter workflow, uh, yeah, which sure, is, which sure. is just, yeah, which is feature branches, um, and what you can do with a feature branch is just re is like I said, re rebase master on occasion. You know, I've definitely done that. You know, every hour you just yeah. rebase master and you just stay stay up to date. Your code isn't changing. Your code isn't isn't you know nothing's happening there. You just um, you just continually staying such that the the origin commit is the is the the latest one is head right um, and then and then what the the cool thing that comes of that uh, like like Michael was talking about is master um, uh, master's uh, commit history just says stuff like added you know added blog added you know instant messaging or whatever just a bunch of features right that that's all that's all that's there it's not like yeah, updated CSS on something, you know, but right. yeah, so yeah. Uh, it keeps it keeps that it keeps that history really really clean, really readable, and really um, uh, productive. I suppose. Yeah, and, and by rebasing, you're you're always making sure that your commits are ahead of master, so that if you do need to squash them, uh, if the, if you squash them and they're ahead of master, then they're going to be okay to merge back into master. It's when you squash something that's behind master that. that so Unless somebody else is working on your branch, see, this is where it's like chosen. Because <coughs> you, yeah, because absolutely, you can, you can just keep on, you know, branch, turtles branch, all the way branch, down, branch, right? Branch. Um, right. I mean, I, I, yeah, you can, be like you can a just Russian nesting doll of branches. Right? Yeah, <laughs> branch from master, branch from. The, but that, again, you can shoot yourself in the foot with a bazooka. So there's a lot stuff. of things you can do. It doesn't mean you want to do them, right? Yeah. So, like I said, that that sort of, if they could make get better. It would be in that way where it, it can tell you what to do. Don't do that. You really want to do this. This is a way better workflow strategy. Isn't there like Git flow or something like I'm that? I'm sure there are solutions for that. Yeah. What's that? You, have you used that before? There's like five branches. <laughs> What's up? We're supposed to, but I'm not yeah. sure I fully understand. Okay. Yeah, the tradition, the Git flows workflow is kind of the traditional Git workflow, which is master branch, develop branch, and feature branches. Mm. Um, so you have develop, which may or may not be merged into master, in <coughs> depending on a release or something like that. Master is the like live working copy that's on a production website, and then developers each have have uh, feature, feature branches. branches where they go. Oh, I'm I'm going to work on the menu, so I create Mike's menu, and that's my feature branch. I do my work. I submit a pull request back to master, or I just merge it back in, depending on the control. The rebasing stuff, I will caution you to say. I wouldn't worry about if you're like a Git beginner. I wouldn't even worry about what we said about rebasing. I mean, that's it's really cool and it's really great for collaborative teams. Um, but you know, for small time, for small level work, it's probably more trouble than it's worth. But it's really important to plant all these seeds, though, because yes. as you as you work with Git and as you sort of dive deeper into using it to empower your workflow, you'll come across more and more situations where you sort of start googling. And the answer says, oh, for that you want to rebase. And you think, oh, I've heard of that. I've always wondered how rebasing yeah, it's works. not scary. So right now we're, we're planting those little seeds. So the idea is that we're generating a lot of questions here. I'm sure that some of you, some of this was a little um, tough to grok over your head right off the bat. But hopefully it made you think of a, of a, of a simple question that would get you one step closer to understanding it. So I'd really like to encourage everyone to ask those questions if we're ready for that. Please. Q&A. Do you have one more thing you want to ask? I have a couple. Two more things, really. I just want to save your question. Just to answer. Stash your question. <laughs> stash it. Get stash that question. So the, the two two thoughts that I want to make that, that I really wanted to get out is one, I just want to make it really clear that Git is not a backup solution, uh, and I think it's really easy for people to get. Oh well, I have Git. I no longer need backups. And there are two reasons that it's not a backup solution. One is uh, GitHub repositories will often get corrupted if you have uh, as they get larger over time. Once a GitHub, once a GitHub repo 
gets to be about two gigs in size, it becomes virtually unusable. Uh, and if you're if you're if you're putting images and movie files and things like that into your GitHub repo, which you don't need to, like it's really like you need to read up on Git ignore strategies and stuff like oh, what yeah, files not about. to version control. Then your your Git repo can get really big, and then one day you go to like commit, and the whole thing is borked, and what you thought you had a backup strategy, you don't have one anymore, right? So I just really want to stress that it's it's great for version control, but if you need it beyond two weeks, the you really still need a backup strategy. So is in your enterprise, you would still be doing nightly backups. Yeah. yeah, is that a limitation of GitHub, uh, the technology? Mm -hmm. No. I is don't think a it's a limitation of the technology. It's a, it's a limitation of the design, right? It, it's not, it, it, if, if what you need is a, a, a snapshot of 20 gigs of files, that's not what GitHub is designed to do. Because, because images and movies aren't really, they don't change every day. Your, your developers aren't working on this, right? Your developers are working on like code files. And and yeah, and so no, GitHub can, can do visual, visual diffing well, of images, but it's, it's, again, it's not what it's for. It's not what it's for. It's, right. um, it, it's, it's, a, really cool. it's a misapplication of the technology. <laughs> yeah. So so you should really think in terms of, I have a backup strategy for my big static files, like images and movies and things that never change. And I have Git for my things that change all the time, like HTML, CSS, PHP. <coughs> so, that was the main thing I just wanted to make sure. You had a question? Well, actually, kind of address the question because I was wondering, I mean, I'm new to it, so is it something you download and put on your server versus working in the cloud? Is it like a little program? And you said it shouldn't last more than two weeks, but does yeah. it get hacked? Does it get, you said corrupted, but is it like something that's... Um, it, it is a program you download and run on your server or on your local machine. Uh, I just said two weeks as, as just like a benchmark. But is GitHub really. a cloud-based? Yes. GitHub. They're two different things. Yeah. yeah GitHub is a different cloud -based service for managing your Git repositories in a, in a common uh, available way so that other people can get them from the same place. And does, do those things get hacked? Yeah, I don't Are know if I've ever heard of GitHub yeah. getting hacked. No, they're relatively secure. They Has it happened? Probably. probably. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Push up there. Yeah, I'm sure somebody's been If hacked. you're publishing private keys and things, oh yeah. yeah. There's uh, Somebody published uh, a post onto the WIMP group not too long ago actually about this very story. Uh, this guy was wanting to learn uh, Python or something like that. So he built his first Python application. Pushed up to GitHub and realized, oh crap! Like I have these public keys like to go out, the to, like go out to this service or something. I can't remember what the service was, but basically, there's bots just constantly searching GitHub, looking for They're these like known passwords. vulnerabilities, yeah. and it caught it like within just like a five minute window of time that he pushed this code, yeah. and already they hacked his account and all that stuff. So oh. well, that was AWS. It was AWS. AWS, AWS API yeah. keys were were mm -hmm. were included in the commit, and it was. That, that it, within a day he had a thousand <coughs> um, invoice from Amazon. Yeah, oh, they yeah. they they voided it. Eventually. Yeah, they did. So because it's a because that SSH yeah. key gave that, the yeah, attacker is access. Files on AWS, right? I no. mean, that's what no. I just thought I read. Well, on I'm the sure site. I would not be surprised if parts of GitHub are resourced to AWS. Yeah, yeah. but it's possible. Uh, there's a difference between Git and GitHub, right? So so yeah. what you're doing is when you have a free account at GitHub, you're you're when you push your code up, it's public. If you have a paid account at GitHub, it's private, and that would never would have happened. Right. Um, Git on your local server or on your local Mac is not going to be any more hackable than your computer itself is, right? Than your than your. Which own might very well be. Private. Which very <laughs> absolutely. If you go to a lot of porn sites, you're probably. You know, if you're don't in don't hate. No. Yeah, don't hate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But uh, we're getting we're going there. We're in the yeah, tree of we're trust. Going, we're going yeah. really deep down in it. Uh, uh, live stream. <coughs> But it's a good question. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Or? Hello, Internet. I, I think so, but I don't know enough to know if it is or not. Okay. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, if you're wondering, you know, do you back up your Git? So like at the company where I work, in addition to a, a, an enterprise GitHub that runs on some servers in our lab, we also have, you know, the company has full corporate enterprise backup. So, you know, the, the analog would be on my desk at home, you know, I use Git for a little for little private projects that I work on, but I don't need to collaborate with anyone, so I'm not using GitHub. But I still have Time Machine running on my Mac, backing up my files. You know, and 
Time Machine is taking incremental backups that go back a year, and I can go back to any. So that's sort of a second layer of data protection. GitHub and Git aren't really providing the data protection, they're providing the workflow mm -hmm. enabling. And when and when you've initialized a, a Git repo basically on your files, like in your in your files on your local computer itself, uh, there's little hidden files that could create the little lock files, essentially your little uh, your little your file little, cabinet. Your little yeah. file cabinet basically that as long as you have that backed up, a lot of all that history and all the revisions and everything will continue to stay there. So that's that's the important file that you want to make sure is backed up. Right. Uh, actually it's a very interesting thing that if you're writing things down, you should write down this. Uh, because I've this is a big mistake that I made a little bit, a little bit too late. I, I said that Git um, uh, doesn't care about cares about content, not files. It does. You do have to tell Git about uh, moving files and renaming them. So there's, it's like a Git has a little wrapper around the Unix, the Unix commands of of move, copy. Is copy in there as well? Is there a Git copy? Uh, I think it's Okay, yeah, git, uh, so you do, instead of move, you do git move, instead of, uh, you know, rename, yeah, git no, rename. No, no you're right, it may be copy. I don't Is there know, a copy as well? That's a good point, I don't know. Yeah, well, so anyway. Well, if you copy a file, yeah. then git will see a file that it's not tracking and ask you to add it. Oh, yeah. so you just so do that. If you, if yeah. you move a file underneath git's nose, it will see a new file that it's never heard of, and it'll see a deleted file. So if you yeah. git move, it manages that for you. Right, right. Or you get and so yeah, or get in that in that history, you'll see renamed something something to, you know to so and so. Right. So um, yeah, Likewise, so be aware you, of that. If yeah. you delete a file, if you RM a file on purpose, if, you know, uh, wrong wrong file name. I just want to get rid of it and start. <coughs> If you've already added that file to Git, Git will now see a change that's waiting to be added for commit, which is a file that's been removed from tracking. So if you, or a file that it's tracking that now has been removed. So if you Git RM, then it removes the file not only from the hard drive, but from Git's registry of files. Yeah. So, so that it won't try to track that now, file. Just be aware of that. Another pro tip. You can do Git RM dash dash cached and that's the file name, yeah, and it'll I, delete It'll delete it from the Git, but, but not, not from delete the, hard the file. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So you can say, I no longer want to track this file. Say it's an image. I no longer want to track this file and have it in Git, but I don't want to delete the file. So is that what you'd have to do if you uh, added a, um, a line to your Git ignore file, but there's some, but there's something already in there? Yes. yes. Yeah. That's exactly the example yeah. I was yeah. going to use. So if you if you're using say SAS or less to precompile your CSS. You know, in our project, we don't commit the compiled CSS. Yeah. You know, we, we let the thing build the CSS when we make a Debian to ship to the server. But in the meantime, I really don't care about the CSS files. They're cruft as far as I'm concerned in between things. But oftentimes, as you start a new dev environment, you'll do a build and you'll get a bunch of that. And then you'll do a git add dot because you're being lazy and you want to add all the files. It's going to go ahead and add all that CSS that you really don't want to track. You want to track the source file that made the CSS, right? So now you go to remove those CSS files. Well, Git still thinks it's tracking them, but you, you don't really want to delete them because maybe you're about to refresh your browser and you'd rather not recompile. You still want the CSS files there. You just don't want them in Git. So you would Git RM cache. Yeah. Yeah. Git add, he said Git add all. I think that it's Git add dot, and it's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, it's, very, it's very wonderful and awesome but it will often add things that you don't want. My, right. my big example I always give people is if you're using Drupal or WordPress, chances are you have a cache directory. And I've seen people accidentally add a gig of cache files. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to their track. Um, which just makes it all it's amazing. Usable. It's going to be yeah. version control, like yeah. grunt files or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, oh, fun. Yeah. that's fun. To Usually out. if you're going to get add dot, you're going to do that once. Yeah. At the very <laughs> beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, right. Right. that's right. At the beginning. Right. right. Yeah. Um, what questions? So for you know early on you you had mentioned hey move SFTPs into their server and edit files directly well that's me and I want to switch I want to be able to switch to something like it because I know that I have messed up sites in the past but how does it work with the workflow in terms of where things are placed i.e. there's obviously the the, the the server version that's live and production and is running but then do I have like a separate development environment either like on my local machine or a separate development environment, like what, on a different server or on a different part of the server? Probably All of the above are viable okay, strategies. Okay, so it really is It's really up to you. what resources you have at your disposal uh -huh. and the level of sort of safety that you're after. Uh -huh. So for a production environment in the sort of classic workflow of master, dev, feature branches, 
Oftentimes there'll be a staging server where dev can be pushed to, so you can see it working with, say, the live data, mm -hmm. or with, you know, see it working in a very close to simulated live environment or context to do what we would call it smoking it out. You know, we might then run all of our integration tests against that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's automated tools that will actually open a browser, click the other page in your site, and tell you if it broke. Cool. Um, of course, even famously, like Facebook does not use those. They use a fleet of 40 human testers. <laughs> that they, they test every thing. Because uh, an automated test will tell you that it worked. It won't tell you what it felt like to use it. Yeah. If it took 45 <laughs> seconds to complete and you were sitting there scratching your, you know, the test, it can tell you that. But it's much easier to find that out with human testing. So you would do all that stuff on that staging server. Mm -hmm. And then because of some the way you set up your deployment tools, you could then say, go ahead and send it live. And that would push it to the... 40, 40 users or a million unsuspecting uh, <laughs> users? I would, I would say it's yeah, it easy. Like I was going to say, it's easy for Facebook to have that strategy when they have billions of dollars to throw Right. Yeah. Human, human testers, testers are expensive, yeah. but they're like the, they're like the pixel. Gold I mean, they'll tell you the second a pixel's out of order, you know, your customer or a human yeah, user will sure. tell you that, for sure. You know. So, yeah. typos are notoriously hard for unit tests to... Right. So, <laughs> to answer your question, you know, if you're on a budget, you don't have a lot of virtual resources, you might be running um, a sort of stripped down version of your live environment right in your dev environment, in your laptop. And you would check your changes there, you know, and then push them live. You know, if you, uh, if you got a little more on the line and you really want to have, say, a set of nodes running on AWS that are an exact mirror image of the live nodes, you would have a way to push it there. And then when you merge, it would be merging to some, you know, with GitHub, Hub, they have these things called um, merge hooks. And so you can have servers watch GitHub and watch its API, and it'll tell the servers when certain things are done, mm -hmm. and vice versa. So in our case, we have a build and deploy uh, automated testing environment called Team City. And what that does is it runs in the enterprise, in the cloud, on the server, and or several, and it sort of watches our GitHub and when certain magical things are done, it will, sorry, vice versa, our GitHub watches it. And so, actually I guess it goes both ways, because I'll make a commit, I'll push up a ch set of changes. That will trigger a test run on the Team City, which is now deploying all the code we've changed to a mirror image of a live environment. It runs all the tests. If all those pass, it sends a message back to GitHub and GitHub merges it into master. Wow. If and only if, right? If and only if, yeah. which then a successful, mer once it's merged into master, that will trigger another run of the test, and if they all pass, it'll trigger building a Debian package that can actually get deployed to our lives or, or to a customer. So. How so. good are you guys going to sleep knowing that <laughs> only when, when this, this set of code that says this is, this is how your site should run, when all those tests are are green only then do, does it does it go live and, and the public can see it and so that there's you sleep, you sleep the final call. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I, I i sleep really good when i realize well, that and, and actually it really the main the, the the other big benefit of that is it actually really speeds up the process of development because uh, uh it, it <coughs> we use a lot of continuous integrations what we call that um, that's what that is yeah. yeah and uh at wp engine we did not right oh, so okay. at wp engine uh, making a big merge or a big release was this very laborious process of, oh, have, have five people read the code and, and checked off and said, okay, that looks solid, whatever. And once you have yeah. GitHub and all these test integrations and, 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 and you've set all that infrastructure up, and these are, these are really new cutting edge things, these testing, whatever. But when you've kind of set that up, then developers can be like, oh, well, I have this pull request, and you can like literally see that, oh, well, it either does pass tests or it doesn't pass tests. And if you've written your tests good, you can say, you know what, I haven't really read all of through this, but it says it's passing tests, so screw it. Let's just merge it. <laughs> and 90% yeah. you know, of the just, time And 90% of the time it's fine. And, and even if it does break, it's something minor that you can go back and fix. And mm -hmm. when it breaks, what it does is it shows you a hole in your test. And you, so you, exactly, go back and so you have to write a new test. And yeah. the yeah. idea is that over time, the, the theory is that over time, your tests improve such that you never make the same mistake twice. Right, right. so uh, so if you think about it, life before all that, yes. any change you make could have broken anything any time, right? Yeah. And you think about life after setting all that tooling up, yes. it's, it's now you're on this process of 
minimizing the amount of time and the amount of probability that any change you make will have an unintended consequence, cause a regression, break something, yeah. and as your test base grows. So Git is sort of one piece of this larger puzzle of sort of tooling and automated workflow and deployment continuous integration. But it's a, it's a piece that I always, I always stress. It, it pays off. It's a pain in the ass to learn. It's a pain in the ass to commit to. But it pays off in dividends. Like It doesn't just pay you back for the time you put into it. It pays you on top of that. Because oh, yeah. the more you learn it, the more you go, how did I ever live without it? How did I ever, how did I survive? How did I keep my job? How did, <laughs> I, how did people pay me? I don't understand. Um, <laughs> So it's really, it, it really is stressful to learn, but. Super but, powerful. Yeah. yeah. There was a question in the back that we missed. Um, yeah, a couple of them. First one, pretty quick. If you reach the two gig limit, say, and it's just getting unwieldy, you um, start fresh with the code, the existing code base? Um, not not really. What you would generally do is you would, uh, you, you try to identify what is taking up all the space. Um, and there are a bunch of like command line things you can do that. There are applications you can down on, uh, download online that'll that'll help you do that. Um, uh, but usually you can identify oh it's oh it's this one media folder that's really taking up all the space, and that's when you do the, the what we were talking about earlier the git rm dash dash cached, which says okay remove all this stuff from git, um, and that will generally clean up a lot of it. And then there are um, there are also there's a command called git gc, and gc stands for garbage collection. <laughs> um, and you can run that periodically, and it will get rid of um, uh, unnecessary cruft in your thing. And there's also a thing called pruning, which is like git gc dash dash prune. And you can specify a date and say, OK, if the commit was before this date, Get rid of it. I don't want it. Um, so you can do things like that to reduce the size before you start over. Uh, starting over is really kind of worst case scenario um, in my book. Okay, so, so um, you have an easy way to find, say, your media files and remove them, the large files. Just yeah, I can. If you, uh, I'll, I'll write it on a napkin. There's a, there's a bash. There's a command line function. Do, are you comfortable in the command line in terms of like? Typing things in. Somewhat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll just I can just I can just show you a command. It's basically uh, du dash sh star, and what that will show you is the overall size of every directory, and then you say, oh, well, this directory is 30 gig, and all the rest are under a gig. That 30 gig directory is where my problem yeah, is. You yeah. can navigate into that directory, and you can run du dash sh star again. It'll do the same breakdown. You say, okay, within this 30 gig directory. There's one directory that's 29 gig, and that's the problem. And keep going until you really kind of narrow it down and say, okay, here's the one area where I could probably not version control these files and, and get away with it. So you're working in Linux, then you have to go back to Git, and then to make up for not adding it to Git ignore it first, is then you remove it. You yeah, you, you would, you I mean, and, and Git is a Linux utility, right? Linux, Git is a Linux utility, so that you would... You would then in Git, you would edit your Git ignore and say, no longer track this folder. You'd put the folder path in Git ignore. And then you would do your Git rm dash dash cache so you don't delete the files. Um, and then that way you remove the files. You're also telling Git never to version these again. And then if you run your Git GC and Git prunes, that should really get rid of all of the, all of the junk. In the, in the so. um, The other question. Um, would a good strategy be for um, a newbie to like have a branch for each person or maybe a branch for each um, tack that you take? Do you guys want to for, for each what that you take? For each tack? Yeah. You know, like, I'm going to try solving the problem one way. And I'm yes, gonna try that's a and great time to use branches actually. I was going to say, Terry, you work at an agency. I mean, do you guys prefer a branch per developer or a branch per feature or how do you guys usually? Do you guys use GitHub? Do you um, we use actually, we use Bitbucket, uh, okay. private, private repositories. Yeah, but you it's know? Git, right? It is, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's like the converse of uh, of GitHub because it's uh, you have to pay to get public repositories. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I, I guess we're flexible when it comes to the size of the task that we're working on. If I'm building my own Drupal module or something like that, I'll, I'd probably do it on a branch. But if we're just making 
you know, CSS updates. It'll, it, we just do it, do it on master. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, be flexible about it. And um, if you have content people working on uh, things, you would create a feature branch or, so, or something like that? To that gets into the database and how you handle, and I, I have not found a good answer for... So when you say content people, you mean people working like on the actual on content of your site? Like they're, they're publishing content in the WordPress itself? Well, I'm actually not thinking actually of the touching, touching HTML pages rather than... Okay, okay, so they're, yeah, so in the case where your content people are editing HTML pages directly, then certainly they can work on branches or, or do, if the HTML is, is a valid target for version control, which it sounds like it would be in that case. So you said that there isn't anything you can think of for database on the same, because you know, a lot of these things, Drupal, WordPress, they're all... Moreover, configuration options are set in the database, sure. right? Uh, so that's... Um, so if yeah, you if you make a or I mean things you know, things that are considered features, right? Like uh, you know, I use a lot of uh, Drupal views, right? Um, and, and and that sort of thing. And yes, there's a way to export that and just put it in a file. But I haven't really found a good a, like a a workflow that feels productive, uh, and like that. Than exporting to SQL and just you know reimporting if you make a, yeah. a, a screw up. The yeah. The, at, at Pantheon, the kind of analog, the, the the basically hard and fast rules of it is that, like, Git, you can you can go, you can move Git commits downstream, <coughs> you can move them back and forth and all over the place. Data only goes one way, right? You can you could take data at the top and move it back to your dev environment. You can't move data from your dev environment to your live very easily unless you're willing to give up changes on your live environment, right? There's no. There's no easy way. In WordPress, there are two products. There's one called Ramp, um, which is a WordPress product that is, in theory, designed to take changes from a database, from a development database, and merge them into your live database. It works pretty good. It's really expensive. Um, uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not a magical get thing, really. It's, it's more of a WordPress hefty logic kind of thing. Um, and with WordPress, there's at least one plugin that does, that writes your config options to a file okay. that then you can migrate. Nice. I assume it's probably like Drupal where, yes, it does it, and yes, it works under certain conditions, uh, but it's not going to be a painless solution. On a, on a cloudless yeah, day with uh, no wind, yeah, of course exactly. it works. Yeah. And it, it's rarely so. the magic solution you're actually looking really for when you're in trouble. So it's really and then in Drupal, the closest the closest thing I've I've found is a, a, a Drush. You guys familiar with Drush? There's Drupal people out there. All two of you. Um, <laughs> it's going to make a comeback. where are you at, man? It's going to make a comeback. Right? Yeah. Drupal. Thanks, man. Way to represent. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, there's... Um, there's something that has that has uh, begun begun working for me, which is um, SQL Sync. It's a Drush command that actually, uh, well, actually, um, SQL Sync takes uh, the site aliases, which is a uh, a, PH, uh, a PHP variable that lives in a file somewhere that describe that defines a website, hmm. right? And so there's there's a there's a variable that you call like local.dev or something like that, and then I have ones called pantheon.dev, and you say drush SQL sync local dev pantheon dev. Right? And does that actually sync schema changes as well as data? Well, it it does. So it doesn't. It yes, but it um, but it does. It doesn't merge, right? It just overwrites. Uh, right. So it's not. It's not really syncing. So it's not really a, a true migration, a DB. It's not a mig It's not a migration. But you know, if you're doing, if you, you know, so for some reason the rule, the rule in your agency or who, you know, wherever you were was like, we're not. Um, I'm the only one. I can trust that I'm the only one making these changes. You know, making changes to the database. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll merge. Um, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll merge local with uh, with live, or live with local. Um, and then you could, and then you kind of get into a slight rebasey style process where I'm going to, you know, bring the database down, make the view or whatever, and then push it, and then push it back. Right. And hope nothing happens. And hope nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, On the yeah. Line. So, so that's one little the, thing. The, the issue of your database changing and how your database can change, you know, it can change by content. It can also change by shape. Mm -hmm. Right. New tables, new columns in the tables. That's that particular pain point. 
has typically been solved at the framework level. Uh, yeah. Django and Ruby on Rails both provide excellent migration, mm -hmm. back, forth, merge, mm -hmm. every which way support, and the sort of one <coughs> value adds that, that is why people choose those frameworks, yeah. is for that purpose. And to be fair to Drupal over WordPress, the, the advantage of Drupal is that is that Drupal at least keeps views in a separate table than it does content. Um, so that in theory, uh, you could well, migrate the views without migrating the, con the content. In theory, oh, nice. you would be replacing. Um, in WordPress, everything's in one gigantic table. Oh, so yes. you yeah. know you create post types and things like that, um, and it's much harder um, to keep that one gigantic table. With, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's the options table. If 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 you're lucky and it's all in the options table, you can migrate that without the post table. But who doesn't want to yeah. write a bunch yeah. of Python yeah. scripts to handle <laughs> yeah, all of that? Exactly. <laughs> So, so ramp actually works to that tries to do migrations, like you said, within the framework level. It says, "Oh, well, you created X number of posts. Which ones do you want to migrate?" And then mm -hmm. it tries to dump them out into an XML file. So. so, really quick on the WordPress stuff, like definitely ramp is a great option. At my at my job, we use it a lot. Like we deal with a lot of really large enterprise clients, like TechCrunch, uh, NBC. We do a lot of work with those kind of entities and uh, we've used ramp a lot for creating staging environments for content to be published yeah. onto live production environments which I think is the best route but it is it is also a costly um, way to go but with that like you know for just like baseline you know like content version control like that's built into WordPress already there is some version history that you could do there branching not so much uh, but I do recall seeing a plugin. I'm trying to remember what it was called, where it, it allows you to to say like, hey, this specific page, like it's already live, but I want to make changes to it. It needs to go through revisions, and you know, I need to have my editorial staff look at this, and then it's ready to go to production. There's a plugin that will actually fork that that post. In essence, I mean, it's totally not doing a, you know a real smooth route. Like I feel like there's probably other applications that could do this better. But when you're working within the WordPress realm, like it works really well, where you can fork that uh, that post. It's there for you to do whatever you want. Nobody else can see it. It's in a, it's, it's in a draft state. You can go through its whole editorial process and say, okay, I want to merge this back in and override whatever was there. And it basically just writes on top of whatever this version looks like compared to the one that's live. I know that there's a plugin out there that does that, but I can't provide you remember the name of it. I think it's called Revisionary. Revisionary? Yeah. I think that's I use it on a site. It works pretty well. Yeah. yeah. How are we on time, Melissa? Uh, it's almost 9 o'clock. Okay. So wow, that went fast. Yeah, a few more questions probably. And, I mean, you guys don't have to leave right away, but I, I do have a couple questions. Um, going back to basics a little bit, for those of us who are, shall we say, more graphically inclined, <laughs> um, GUI programs, what would you recommend? The GitHub app. That's, yeah, that's, a really, that's a really, really good one. And it, it's, there's a GitHub app. And you don't need to use it with GitHub. You know? um, and the really, w one of the really nice things, um, probably like the one way it, it, it's better, like I, it's just better than the command line, is um, you can commit parts of a file. It's like an easy way to commit. You gonna pull it up? I'm gonna try. Cool, man. I believe I have it installed. I don't use it as often anymore. So, um, did it change? Yeah, changes. So those, yeah, those are all the, those are all the, the um, uh, those are all the changes he's made. It'll, it'll flag it as new or deleted. And then, if, if we click on a file, Cordova. Oh, is that green and I can't see it? Yes, green and pink. Yeah. So what? So the, the really nice thing is just go. Yeah, do do the like the click and drag, on a. On the left, can you click and drag? Drag where? On the on the on the right side, like mm -hmm. just committing parts of a file. Yeah, so just a real a really nice way. So, oh really? Okay. I don't know. Um, You'd have to walk me through. Yeah. So it's just a nice a nice uh, e easy way when you only want to make a change to part of a file, right? Um, you know, uh, including a line of Java, uh, including a JavaScript file or something. But there was other stuff later on to the to the markup that that you that you don't want to do yet, or something or something like that. It's a real it's a really nice nice way of handling that. And then there's like the you know push to you know um, the push button or whatever. 
um, and so on and so forth. Do you guys know of any others? Well, I, I was going to say I could take a 30 second and show you how Pantheon handles this. Uh, it's a commercial because I work for Pantheon, so disclaimer. Um, but real quick, I can show you, like Pantheon has kind of uh, uh, built their whole platform around Git, but, but with the understanding <coughs> that they won't actually use Git. So what they've done is they've created an interface for you to um, so an interface for you to let me just pick one of my test sites. Uh, here's a test site that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> they, they, the they love they love name. unicorns at Pantheon. Um, <laughs> Who so Who doesn't? Uh, so at Pantheon, at Pantheon, they force you into the dev test and live workflow. You can't SFTP into live. You just can't do it. Actually, you can't even SFTP SFTP into dev or test. You can only SFTP into, into uh, dev. Um, but what you'll see is that, um, let me just make sure this is actually an installed working site before I try to demo it. Um, no, it's <laughs> not an installed working site. Um, um, Very good. Yeah. <laughs> it was something like that. You can try to guess if you want. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time installing a keylogger. I was hoping I'd get something yeah. better. <laughs> it's Dragon. Three, four, this password was Dragon. Three. So, so you see here we have SFTP and Git. Um, the default connection mode is usually SFTP. I'm in Git. Um, so what it says is I can actually switch to SFTP mode. And then I can go back into my site. And I can go to you know the plugin installer just like you would do uh, any other site, and I'll do mic and uh, password, which I believe is my password. And I can go in here, and I can add new plugin, uh, say WooCommerce. Um, WordPress has gotten pretty years since I did. Actually, we'll just we'll just I'll just install this this plugin right here. Install it. Okay, activate it, fine. Again, we said database changes won't take place. Um, so now when I go back here, uh, and after a few seconds, um, we can refresh. Should we use pusher? We and we like should see if this worked properly, which it would be my luck that it would not work. Okay, there it goes. Pops up, says 53 files changed. Well, that was the plugin that we just installed. It'll show you the files that changed. No need to go into Git, you just go, my plugin that I just installed uh, and click commit. It does the commit for you. Does it switch back to, to Git connection mode when it does you, that? If you want to, okay. right? You can keep it in SFTP mode, but the point is that goes that, that becomes a part of a, of a version control even within the SFTP mode uh, that once you're, once you're kind of square and there's no dirty files out there, you can switch back to the Git commit mode or what you'll see is if you go to test now, um, I have to refresh. To I'm sorry, it. I have to go to code. In, in test, if I refresh here, it should tell me that I committed. No, it's in dev. It's in dev and it says 50 changes are. Scroll down. What? I was in dev. What you have an expert user here. Your what? <laughs> isn't there? Isn't it in dev? It says you know fifty oh, one commit is. is. I'm sorry, it's under it's under deploy. So, oh. so but there it is. So so I made those commits, and now I can say, oh well, go ahead and bring them, you know, go ahead and bring them into tests. So you can you can kind of manage some of this commit <coughs> without, without the Git knowledge itself, but you always have. Uh, if you're in Git mode, you do you do that from the command line, just like you would normally do. So, so we built in kind of a UI for it. It's not nearly as fancy as Git for Mac, but it can be really handy for some people. Um, but it's also streamlined and simple, and does only what you need. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was going to mention a couple other. At least on the Mac, um, I've used um, thank you. Mm -hmm. at Lazian, which is also Bitbucket. And company, they have one that's free called Source Tree, yeah. which is very sophisticated. It, it can do a lot of stuff that the Git uh, app, GitHub app, can't do, especially when it comes to merges. Um, and then there's one called Tower, which is what I swear by at this point, and it's about 50 bucks or maybe it's 60 bucks or something. But that's 
cheap compared to the trouble I've gotten into. <laughs> and, um, that's how I live in Git at this point, is using Tower. Um, and it gives you a, a beautiful graphical interface. You can see all these things. And then, and then I use an external um, diffing program for um, doing the merges. But, um, but you can do the, you know, you see all visually what's, it'll give you each branch. And it's kind of like a railroad track. And you can kind of see, you know, what commits are in, in each branch. And, um, and it takes a lot of that command line stuff and translates it into a pretty rich, um, and the other advantage of Tower, you know, it and the source tree are very similar in its cap their capabilities, but Tower actually has help um, that refers back to the to the graphical UI, whereas the other is they kind of say, well, go read the Git docs. <laughs> and then you've got to translate that back and how, what does that mean in the graphical environment. So anyway, um, those are a couple of resources on the Mac, and I know there's some also on Windows, but I can't. So Tower is Mac only, and it's fifty nine dollars. Yeah. For the thirty day free trial, and uh, Source Tree is free, and it's on both Mac and Windows. Yep. Um, my my other question that I had, and um, this might scare the guys on the panel, but um, are there any of you here who might benefit from doing a, a workshop on Git? Raise your hand. Mm. Anybody that would want to do that. Hang on, hold your hands up. I'm going to count. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay, so any of you guys, if that's something that you are important, we'll talk later. We'll talk or later. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. Uh, how important is it that one learns the command line over using a GUI? Are they equivalent in capability? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my just off the cuff answer would be that what's important is that, is that at some point you understand what the tool is doing and whether that is best achieved for you by getting under the hood I mean, when I was in computer science classes you know they they showed us they showed us how to write an email from scratch right to the SMTP <laughs> server. nice how to write the headers in text then delimit the body, write the body, <coughs> and send it. And the reason why they had us do that, as soon as we click send, the professor said, that's what your client, your email client, is doing for you every time you write an email. Mm -hmm. It's taking what you put in the boxes, and it's just plugging them into a textual message that it sends to this email server. So that sort of was like, whoa, okay, everything that goes around the internet is just letter, it's just text. Yeah. You know, it's just been put into a format that a listening end cares about, right? So Git is no exception in the sense that the the GUI tools, all they're going to do is execute the Git commands for you through Git's API behind the scenes. So whichever way gets it to where you understand how it's manipulating your files, why it's doing that, is is best. Do you I'm know of a feature sure. that a source tree will show you the, the git commands that it's executing? Mm -hmm. So oh, nice. and, and so a tool like that, especially for a beginner, can be extremely informative because someday you'll get a call at nine thirty at night. <coughs> Dude, can you log into the server? Everything's down. We don't know why. And you'll you'll know how to make a change on the fly. I mean, I've 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 uh, I've SFTP'd into a desktop at work from my phone. Made a very small change to a to, to correct a typo that somehow got committed, and then committed it, and I was able to do all that from the command line. So it's very powerful to know the command line when you absolutely have I'm to not, have it. The, the you must it's awesome. Right <laughs> but 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 nine out of ten times you don't want to take the time to type all that out. So if you can use a, a GUI tool, that's awesome. If it can show you what it's actually doing, so now it's informing you how it's actually using Git. That's very powerful. I'm going to take the opposing view, but I want to give Terry a chance to say something before I get the counterpoint to that. You disagree with him? Yes, I disagree. Oh, okay. I don't disagree. That was like the most holistically I, 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 I know. I disagree with him. Disagree. Disagree. Yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, yeah, personally um, I, think, I think the command line is more powerful, and I'm all about power. Uh, uh, no, I mean, it's like, yeah, they're just, when you you know when you create that graphical thing there are some abstractions that you can't you can't describe you know um, so you know anything to do with like um, I, I, this is I guess I guess it really gets beyond just get and other but to 
Unix tools in general, but things that have to do with rec you know recursively going through a directory structure or, so or something like that. That's one command, you know, versus having to do that through your through a, the, the finder or something like that. You know, um, yeah, it makes it makes for power and, and productivity. So I yeah I tend towards the, the command line I, for that reason. What you got? My argument is absolutely I completely agree. Sometimes the GUI is plenty fine enough, and they're wonderful and they're fun to look at, and they make it easy to learn the tool. But my argument is that any time spent learning using the command line itself is not time wasted, right? Uh, I learned the command line so that I could use Git because it was in the early days of they didn't have GUIs or the GUIs weren't really well done. And and learning the command line through Git made me better, <coughs> made me better at what I do because then the next thing you go is you learn this thing called rsync and you go, what? I yeah. can move an entire, f like, I can move 10,000 files across the internet in like 30 seconds? What yeah. are you kidding me? This yeah. is the, SFTP sucks, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, and once you unlock the command line, it, it, it really unlocks so many things. And none of these cutting edge tools are ever designed for the GUI first, no, right? They're, they're always command line tools first because they're designed by the nerds. And, and, and then just, you know, I, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with GUIs. I think the most important thing is that you, uh, GUI is better than not getting at all, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, if it's between using a GUI and not knowing Git, use a GUI, because Git is going to be, in 10 years, everything's going to be running around Git. If you don't have Git, you can't function on the web. Um, uh, but if, you, if, you're, if you've got the time and you're interested, the right. command line is worth it. It pays off. Um, so you're yeah. saying that command line, that Git is a gateway drug into the world very of much so. <laughs> that's actually, I that's think a that's point. a great way to put it. That's actually that's a, great way. Way. That's a good way to put it. And I agree in yeah. the sense that if you, for all of us, there's a time when the command line is new, it seems daunting, it yeah. seems like the hardcore, you know, nerd kung fu yeah. approach is always the yeah. command line. And you sort of aspire to that hardcore nerd kung fu, you want it, but you're not personally there. Yeah. A tool like Git is a great way to force yourself to sort of get there or to drag you through getting there. It's yeah. like, um, it's that thing where when you lift something heavier than you think you can for a while, then all of a sudden other less heavy things seem like nothing at all, oh, you know, right. to do. And so when you beat down the doors of Git's mysteries and how it works, all of a sudden you do find yourself being much more proficient in your environment from a CLI perspective. And let's face it, all these tools like Node, Ruby on Rails, Django, um, I don't know how much WordPress really has a command line environment. They do now, actually, um, yeah. But a huge portion of, of jobs that are waiting for you out there, just for your training to catch up to the skills that job needs, you go and you sit and you watch these professionals do this job, and there's a million GUI tools out there, but the CLI is so good in these environments that you learn, you know, 20 or 30 keywords, every combination under the sun of those keywords will do something for you, you know, whether you're in Node or Django or something else. John? I, I just wanted add on to that is that once you're on the command line, some one of you, one of you three was making the point that everything on, on is ultimately just text being shipped shipped back and forth over, right. the, uh, over the internet. And uh, if you're on the command line and you feel and you you get comfortable there, well, one of one of the things that's magical about the command line is this idea of programs that are very good at doing the thing that they do, and then being able to string them together, typing or whatever the idea is. And so suddenly, you've got this magical tool that can do one thing, and you can connect it to these other things. And it's, it's insane what you can do once you're comfortable on the command line. Um, it really is magical. But, uh, and, and the Linux really shell is its own dev yeah. environment. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, like imagine you've written a 10,000-page book all in individual text files with the, with the character named Bobby, and you want to change the character's name to Susie. Try doing that in your Finder window in Mac, right? But it, on the command line, you, it's literally like maybe a 20 character command to get that and done in the space of a you, second. You could Google that and there will be a hearty forum post yeah. where like <laughs> yes. 20 of the world's top nerds have yeah. battled it down to the shortest one line. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. No, It'll dude, that sucks. I got two characters off of yeah. that. Yeah. Like, this way. Yeah. And you will benefit from that Google post. Sure. Uh, one thing I want to add on to uh, your guys' response to Nate's question, just, you know, the difference of, you know, command line or GUI. Um, I definitely back these guys, like, you know, command line, like, getting to know how these tools work is very 
important. <coughs> but the times that I've had hiccups with relying on a GUI to do certain things has come down to those those horrible moments that it's like, I need to revert a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, a GUI hasn't been very helpful because it's it's a it can be kind of a, a hard thing to grasp if you're not used to doing that. And what I've learned is each GUI has slightly different terminology for common things that is you know written down and everyone knows this if you know the command line function. So like the times that I've had to like really get get in there and revert a huge chunk of code, um, you know, total disaster happened. And you know, trying to do Google searches, it's all like all the command you know get commands, so like you know the actual command line commands for it. And it's like, okay, well, how do I translate that to source tree or to tower? Source tree and tower call it two completely different things. Mm -hmm. And that made it just that much harder to try to figure out, like, what what do I do here? And you know, ultimately, yeah. you, know, you, you fall back onto what you know what you're actually reading of what needs to be done, and it's way more straightforward than what the GUI is telling you. Now to go the other way and defend Chris's original position that the <laughs> GUIs are better. I didn't say they're oh, better. Well, I said they are useful. They are very useful. <laughs> and it does definitely depend on what your goal is. Are you a developer? If you're a developer and you want to you want to write code, I'd say learn the command line. If you're a project manager and what you're trying to do is see what's going on, then totally the GUIs are probably every bit as much as you need. Um, and and are probably going to be a much better use of your time if if your intention is not to be a developer, but to be a designer. Then maybe maybe the command line might be uh, an efficient use of your time. So case in point, a uh, guy that works for me puts in some changes. Hey, can you review these changes before I commit them? Am I going to pull his branch, merge it, and do a git diff? No, I'm going to go to GitHub where they show me the beautiful file with the pink and the green and all yeah. the different changes. <laughs> That's a GUI. I'm using yeah. a GUI right then to look at Git, right? But I'm, it's just a way, that's one case where the GUI is just way more help, way faster, you know? But, um, like your example, you know, knowing what's going on in the hood, when you go to search the vast majority of published help that's out there for you on Stack Overflow, other resources, the example is going to be the command line, how they do it on the command line. So if you want to harvest the benefit of that, then you want to be comfortable. GitHub also, their GUI also has a neat little thing called Plane, which oh, is Blaine. really yeah. awesome. You should investigate that. That's if something goes wrong and there's a line of code, it, you can look at the file and it will show you every line of code, which author and commit put that line of code there. So <laughs> if, you, if you would identify that line 51 is the problem, you can identify the author of line 51 and exactly in the most they, recent, in commit. The most recent yeah. commit and exactly when they put it in there and send them an angry and email. call them up. <laughs> well, on my team, we have a pink sombrero for that individual. <laughs> and he wears the pink, he or she wears the pink sombrero for the rest of the day once they've been found. Oh, that is so good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Truth be told, but get blame is actually one of the more like semantic and descriptive commands. You know? Yeah, yeah it actually about is it, like, spot on. It's yeah, it's like, awesome. that's exactly what Whereas it does. checkout doesn't mean what you think. No, what the, yeah, yeah, what is that? <laughs> Get blame means what you think it means. Did this. Point the finger. <laughs> yeah, point, point and yell at someone. Yeah, Actually, exactly. in, in, a, in a more, in a less, in a less negative way that's very useful is like if you take over a code base that is like <coughs> five years old and there have been a hundred developers working on it and you go, is this good code or bad code? I don't know. It looks like it might be bad, but it might be good. Sometimes blame goes, oh, well this was put here by Bob two months ago as opposed to you know, Steve three years ago, and you That's go, oh, okay, that helps you kind of decide, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not all bad. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, good time to get it. Thank you, guys. Yeah.